So we're all incredibly lucky to welcome back Jack McDonald, the CEO of PolySign. Um, before we kick off, just a little bit on Jack's background. Jack's been in traditional finance his whole career before getting into the digital assets space. He started out on Wall Street as an institutional broker, then a relationship manager at UBS, dealing with VC, hedge funds, pensions, private equity, etc. He joined a private company called Conifer, based in San Francisco, took over from the founder, um, had a broker dealer business and a fund administration business, which he grew very impressively from 5 billion to 125 billion, culminating in an exit in 2016. Um, just a bit of context for those that are new here and don't know. PolySign builds institutional grade infrastructure for investors to secure and transact in digital assets across the capital markets and payment sectors. It is the foundation and the glue of this sort of new financial paradigm that we're entering. Because for certain institutions to get involved, using a qualified custodian for their clients' assets, be that crypto or traditional assets, is imperative. And actually, that's been made ever more apparent by the SEC, who's just proposed regulation that will mandate all crypto investment and trading institutions to use qualified custodians instead of self-custodying. PolySign stands to be the primary beneficiary of this regulation as a regulated quali um, qualified custodian itself. And it's swiftly becoming apparent that you guys are filling a gap that has been missing all along. So we've got a lot to get into and I'm gonna hand the reins over to Joe, who I'm not gonna introduce. Joe, over to you. Thank you so much. He really needs no introduction. That's right. <laughs> So Jack, um, I, before I start, um, I just want to provide a caveat to our audience when you're doing your Q&A, which you know, Karim and team will moderate, right? PolySign today is still a private company. Uh, that means it doesn't make detailed public disclosures of its operations, its financials, its customers, and so on for competitive reasons. Just that's no different than Link2 or any other private company. So just um, understand that, right? That, that you know, there's only a certain level of detail into which Jack can go. And uh, that's not because he's being rude. It's just the way that we run private companies. Okay, so Jack, I'm going to divide our conversation before we go into the Q&A into um, three parts, right? And the first is, I'd like maybe for us to talk about PolySign's product offering, what those are, what problems they're solving in the market. Um, part two uh, would be to talk a little bit about PolySign's commercial progress, how you're making headway in, in the market. And then maybe a final part where I, I can maybe extract some of your thoughts on the future of PolySign and the future of the market in which you operate. Sounds um, great. Okay. Good. So I'll uh, let me start with uh, part one. Um, as as a preface, right, and I think uh, Irene intimated this. Our our view at Link Two, and it was uh, the fundamental investment thesis that uh, caused us to make the first and now continuing investments in PolySign. That view is that we're not going to get broad based adoption of the digital asset investment class until it develops the same kind of market infrastructure that supports traditional markets, right? Three of those foundational elements of traditional market structure are number one, third-party qualified custodians, number two, professional fund administrators, and number three, clearing houses for wholesale settlement of trades between institutions. Um, we reckon that your product offering basically addresses each of those key foundational elements of market structure, uh, but you're doing it by creating effectively the digital asset version of those things through standard custody, MG Stover, and in the future, Atomic Net. Um, can you walk us through each of those three elements of your product offering? Kind of, and in layman's terms, <laughs> you know, describe as best as you can what they do and the problem that they're solving. Sure. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to come back. I really enjoy my, my visits with you guys. And I, I must say, I hope you're, you're feeling pretty smart this week uh, with the SEC proposed rule changes around custody. It fits very well into what it is that we're building. And I think the thesis that you've had since investing is certainly starting to play out. Um, so to your point, we really have three businesses. I'll go through them one by one, the custody, the fund administration, and the settlement 
business and they're at different stages of their life cycle. We'll start with custody, Standard Custody and Trust, a wholly owned subsidiary of PolySign. And just to remind uh, all of our guests today, all of the equity that we've raised to date, all the equity that Link2 owns is all in the parent company, PolySign, that owns 100% of what I'm going to be talking about today. It owns all the IP, which is critical in the business that we're building, and it owns all the service businesses. So Standard Custody and Trust, which is a New York trust bank, qualified custodian, provides custody and escrow services to institutions who are looking to store their digital assets. Let me unpack that a little bit. The problem we're solving for is safekeeping of digital assets. And for institutions in the US, and I'm gonna caveat this, that everything I say is really global in nature. And the whole digital asset market place is global in nature as opposed to, let's just say the US stock market. Uh, so it's a big opportunity. While most of our business is centered in the US, we do think globally in terms of of how we're building that business out and what we're what we're doing there. The problem we're solving for is safekeeping of digital assets. There's a lot more complexity around storing a digital asset as opposed to a traditional asset. And from a regulatory standpoint, we set out from inception to be able to meet the custody rule of the Investment Advisor Act of 1940 which states among other things that if you are a fiduciary managing more than 110 million of capital on behalf of your investors, you as an advisor must do a number of different things to run your business to meet that SEC mandate. One of them is the custody rule. And the custody rule states that in order to provide custody to investment advisors, you either need to be a broker dealer regulated by FINRA you can either you could also be a futures commission merchant regulated by the CFTC, or you could be a trust company regulated on a state by state basis. And there are a lot of other requirements that go along with that. When you get into digital assets, which is both cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, or non crypto, so non um, peer to peer currencies, let's just call it that, uh, you know, in the case of Bitcoin. But when you get into other sort of assets, traditional assets that may be tokenized or digitized over time, that to store those assets in digital form today, FINRA has not allowed any broker dealers to do that. The CFTC has allowed, I think, two FCMs to, to warehouse futures because they're commodity futures. In Bitcoin and Ethereum, you can trade the future, but, but not the underlying. Or you would go to the trust company route. Trust companies have been licensed, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nevada, a few, uh, and New York. New York by far being the highest hurdle to overcome. And I think there's 22 different um, custodians that have been licensed, not in New York, but in you know overall. And in New York, there's far fewer than that. And so that's really been the only avenue for institutions to go through. And that relative um, narrow opportunity to your point, which I agree with, has been one of the deterrents from more institutions coming into the space. Because if you are a traditional hedge fund or mutual fund or whatnot, um, who buys and sells stocks and bonds and want to dabble in crypto, <clears throat> if you want to go to your traditional prime broker, your Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, BNY Mellon, State Street, whomever is providing custody or prime brokerage, those organizations do not support digital assets today from a custody standpoint. On Wednesday, the SEC proposed, keyword proposed, a broadening of the custody rule to include number one, specifically digital assets into their definition of the assets that, that would require an investment advisor to use a QC. So they're, they're essentially proposing a codification of what's already existing today, but, but in the scope of the definition, you never had crypto or digital. Now you do. We think that's a positive from the standpoint of validating that there's a there there. It's credentializing. Just like the president's executive off, um, order in the summer basically said, hey, regulators, go regulate this space. What President Biden was saying is there's a there there. This isn't just a corner case. It's big enough to pay attention to. I think what the SEC came out and said on Wednesday was 
just that. The other thing they said was that qualified custodians to support this new asset class need to do a lot of things to meet our enhanced definition around what it means to be a qualified custodian for digital. And they went through a number of attributes that mirror in many ways what exists in traditional finance today, not to mention having segregated accounts, which standard custody has today. There's no commingling of client accounts number one with other clients and number two with the clients and the corporate entity, like we saw with FTX. Standard custody, 100% segregated accounts. Number two, billing and reporting needs to happen at least quarterly. Standard custody reports monthly to our customers. Number three, needs to be subject to routine surprise exams. Check, standard custody recently had an exam, a routine exam, uh, from FinCEN. We've got our uh, regulatory exam uh, coming up with New York DFS. So check, we do that. Number four, you know, being basically bankruptcy remote. So the client assets are protected in the event that the parent uh, had financial hardship bankruptcy. Check. All Again, all of our clients segregated. We've got a whole wind down plan with the regulators. And furthermore, um, a lot of contractual requirements in terms of the language that would exist in the contract that would exist between the custodian and the client. We've got a lot of that and we'll continue to um, incorporate more language as these proposals go through a 60 day comment period and whatever ultimately becomes uh, the requirement will certainly comply with. But we feel very validated in terms of the standard custody model. And we think we're gonna be beneficiaries, not only because of the way we set standard custody up, but also, and very importantly, uh, because we're really conflict, conflict free in terms of our business model. The other thing the SEC said, having assets placed on an exchange to trade or a lend or a borrow platform doesn't equate to being in a qualified custodial platform. They need something else in addition to the, that. And a lot of what's been happening and a lot of the pitfalls that have happened over the last year in crypto have been when investors have taken their assets and put it on a platform that gives very high yielding sort of returns because you are lending or borrowing or, or margining or doing something with that asset. Uh, and in many cases, it's leaving a qualified custodian and going somewhere else. And, and during that duration, it would not be held in a qualified custodial platform. We don't do any of that. So I've said before, you know, boring is the new sexy evidently. And our business is very boring in that regard. Now, there is an opportunity for us to partner with those platforms as part of our escrow offering, which we're very, very excited about. And we think over the last 72 hours, the opportunity set for that business has just grown significantly and, and the upside is, is magnitude magnified you know, quite meaningfully in terms of, of how we are positioned, the business model being conflict-free, segregated accounts, insured, regulated, et cetera. So we're, we're very, very excited about it what we're doing in standard custody. Could I just interject a quick uh, uh, question in, on the whole subject of your uh, custody service, uh, Jack? And that is, it's quite clear and you've outlined in specific ways how the very high regulatory compliance um, aspect of your business is truly a differentiator and now a competitive advantage because there's a whole bunch of custodians out there that may provide custody but aren't regulatorily compliant in the way that you guys are. But the other thing I wanted to focus on is that at the level of the underlying technology, you guys are also um, have built um, a, a custody product that is technically superior in terms of the security, for example, of the assets being custody compared to your competitors so I just want to maybe have you speak to that point. It's not just the regulatory compliance, the underlying product too has That's intrinsic right. qualities yeah, we, that make it superior. We are the only custodian in the industry on the planet that has a blockchain at our core, which was designed and developed by Arthur Brito, who was one of the three co-founders of Ripple, uh, who founded PolySign. I joined, I think, as employee number three or four um, a CEO, but Arthur founded the company. And he was very 
firm in his conviction that there was a better way to do custody, even though custody was a very nascent part of the business at the time, but having a blockchain at our core that essentially stitches together the best different attributes from other types of solutions out there, but also importantly meets a lot of the regulatory benefits of storing in an immutable way every step of every transaction, every person who initiates a transaction or a withdrawal, every person who approves it timestamped. There is this immutable golden copy of, of truth uh, that exists that you can always go back in time uh, in the event that there was ever a problematic transaction uh, and be able to trace exactly when and where and what happened. That's in and of itself unique. There's also something uh, more technologically important in terms of how we take this sharding of the keys, which is a bit of a concept to wrap your head around, uh, and, and run that through the hardware to make it even more robust. Uh, so we have, we believe, the most secure technology out there while also being the most accessible, which is really important to do that. There was a question just that popped up in my screen that I'll just quickly answer, which was a distinction that's relevant here, the difference between ownership and control of the assets. So, you know, if, if if Endoso Capital uh, is a client of standard custody and you own some Bitcoin, you deposit that into our uh, vault. We never take ownership uh, of the Bitcoin. It's always held in your name. You are the investor. You're the owner of it. Uh, the control of that, because um, when you buy a cryptocurrency, you essentially get a alphanumeric code or key that is your ability to control the access of that. And in uh, layman's terms, it's a bearer instrument. So you've, we've all heard these stories about, you know, I take it on the yellow post-it, I put it under my keyboard, uh, or I bury it in a thumb drive in the backyard, and, and um, I forget where I put it. And I can never retrieve it because it's a one of one. We take that, essentially, that mnemonic code for you, uh, and we um, uh, create a new key for you. We separate into three pieces, and we store it in different uh, hardware uh, models. And so uh, we keep that very safe. And it's only when you want to transfer it to those keys come together and essentially unlock uh, the instrument. So while you would continue to own the asset as a customer of ours, we essentially control it. We can't move it on our own the way the system's built. So there's no, uh, there's no opportunity of collusion in it. We need you to authorize us to move it. Um, but the control is what sits within the four walls of the regulated entity, the qualified custodian. Let me jump to uh, the next business, just in the interest of time, MG Stover, and we can go back to any of this as, as you'd like. So MG Stover, the leading fund administrator in digital assets, um, uh, we're gonna be announcing an award here, um, actually when we're in New York, Joe, which I've been embargoed to talk about, but we're getting an award for having the best technology in the in the digital asset space for fund administrator, which we're quite proud of. Wow, um, congratulations. And, and that business is basically a, um, a business that performs, as all fund administration does, accounting and reporting to investors. So we'll go back to Endoso Capital. And I'd love to have you as a customer, Joe. So if you're ready to start an a investment advisor, uh, we'll onboard you and give you <laughs> friends and well, family. You, you won't friends. have me, but I promise you, you will have Link too. There you go. Um, so basically what we do is we do the accounting, whether you're a VC or a hedge fund or a family office or an RIA, we will do the accounting, we will do the pricing of your portfolio, we'll monitor and manage your inflows and outflows, we deal with your investors, we handle your audit support, your tax support, we report to investors every month to say, you know, um, you know Joe Smith uh, put in a million dollars at the beginning of the year at the end of the quarter, that investment is worth a million too. And you don't have all the documentation around that. So an independent third party that's doing the accounting and the reporting and whatnot. They, namely Matt Stover and his team, has built an unbelievable business um, over the last, uh, really almost coming up on, I believe they started in 2015 or 2016, um, and an enviable list of, of clients, really the top tier clients in the space. They were running up against some capacity constraints I've known Matt for a long time because, as Irene mentioned, prior firm I ran had a custody and a fund administration business, and uh, we had an opportunity to participate in a process to acquire that business and immediately jumped at the chance. In, in starting PolySign, if you take a step back, our vision was 
to start with custody and then build this surround sound of other services to complement custody in the same way that the traditional asset servicing firms do. If you look at BNY Mellon or State Street uh, uh, or a Northern Trust, just to pick three, all those custodial banks start with custody at their core and then have this, we keep referring to it as a surround sound of complementary services like fund administration, like treasury, collateral management, et cetera. And we want to build those businesses out. Uh, our vice chairman, uh, Tim Keeney, used to run all asset servicing at BNY Mellon. So he and I have shared this vision of where the business would ultimately go. It happened quicker than we thought because of the opportunity to acquire MG Stover. The clients segments are the same. So the idea is to cross sell custody to the fund administration clients, sell fund administration to the custody clients. Uh, and what we can do with the data behind the scenes in terms of reconciling data, pricing uh, positions, reporting, et cetera, really starts to have some powerful synergies uh, when you put those businesses together. And so we're quite excited uh, about that business. It's been six months. We did a capital raise uh, in the middle of last year, brought in some great investors uh, to lead that round and uh, to acquire that business. And we're very excited about partnering those businesses going forward. Um, you know, skipping ahead, we're all investors and, you know, part of investing is exiting. And I do think about that. Um, my job as a CEO is to grow a business uh, that will ultimately result in an exit of some sort that can take many shapes and sizes, but one of the strategic um, uh, thesis that we had in acquiring the MG Stover business is it makes it more attractive ultimately on the exit because it mirrors this business model uh, that the traditional asset servicing firms have and could be a tuck in acquisition for one of those types of banks you know, down the road when we're ready to get to that, to that point. The third business we have is called Atomic Net, and that is really designed to provide instant and atomic settlement between a broad range of, of asset transfers. Atomic in this instance refers to really, you can think of it as all or nothing or a pass fail. So Joe, you want to um, buy something that I have for sale and we um, don't know each other and we have a desire to do a trade, but we're not quite sure who's going to go first. I said, Joe, why don't you wire me the money and then I'll send you the stock certificate or I'll drop the car off in your driveway or whatever it is. And you said, that's one idea, Jack. I'll tell you what, why don't you drop the car off and then I'll wire you the money. And uh, so to overcome that, Atomic Settlement basically would say, Joe, you put your money in escrow. I put my stock certificate in escrow. Once any conditions precedent are met, and we do this through blockchain technology and whatnot, then we instantly transfer and settle. And so we either both fail or we both succeed. And there's no situation where one of us would be unhappy with the outcome because those conditions have been met. The, the problem we're trying to solve for is the lack of ability to do that across different types of venues jurisdictions, asset classes, et cetera. And so when you get into um, a scenario, our view of the world and part of the reason why we're so excited to have Link2 uh, on our cap table and as a strategic partner as we you know, build out the relationship is that we also very much believe in the democratization of finance, which is a core principle and foundational block of, of Link2. And we envision a world where Sally Smith has, you know, shares in in PolySign, let's say, um, or Link2 has shares in PolySign, and somebody else has some um, uh, over at Securitize, where there's a, you know, a, a KKR fund that's been tokenized, and they have a fractional interest in that KKR fund, and Joe Schmo has a um, uh, a Bitcoin holding over at Coinbase. And, uh, you know, Jenny Jones has some money, cash held at Wells Fargo and on and on. And all those people would like to somehow trade with one another. But Jenny Jones doesn't have an account at Coinbase or the, you know, the analogy, whatever name I use at Coinbase doesn't have an account 
had linked to. And the question is how can those different marketplaces interact with one another? And so what we're trying to do is bring liquidity to those different marketplaces through the settlement network and um, allow for the instantaneous secure transfer of assets between different venues. You know, I don't know the median age uh, of the of our guests here today. I'm 58, and I remember when the internet uh, came out. And if you were an AOL subscriber, and I was a CompuServe uh, subscriber, and Irene was at Yahoo, and Karen was at um, MindSpring, we could not email each other. If you remember in the early days, I'd say, "Hey Joe, I want to send you an email," and you say, "Oh, that sounds cool. Uh, here's my AOL address." I said, "Well, I'm not an AOL, and I'd have to become an AOL, right?" And then I could email you as crazy as that sounds. And that's kind of the way it exists today. There's more and more uh, digital assets uh, being traded in different siloed marketplaces, but there's no connective tissue between them. This is our moonshot idea, frankly, because if you advance the cause, and, and this speaks very well to what's happening in the broader tokenization thesis that's taking place, more and more uh, big institutions are uh, believing in the future tokenization where a traditional asset will take a digital form and be tokenized. And there's all sorts of downstream consequences within capital markets as to how um, that will play itself out. Atomic Net is an integral part of that future fabric. It speaks to a um, initiative central banks will have around digital currencies and how you put payments into the economy. It speaks to um, private markets, you know, ultimately um, going public. I mean, there's just many, many ramifications uh, in this space. And so that's still a little bit of the skunk works. Uh, but as we talk to more and more institutions about it, I can tell you that there is a steady increase of interest, so much so that some uh, have started arguing to me that they believe that cryptocurrency will ultimately, history will prove, will have been the proof case for the underlying technology, distributed ledger technology and blockchain te technology that will support tokenization. And that that's the real TAM here, total addressable market that we should all be getting excited about. That's great. We're looking forward to working closely with you to make that vision of the future uh, happen in terms of atomic net, because um, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's important also, not just because it's going to allow um, the link up of all the discrete and right now separate trading venues, right, for digital assets, but it also carries the promise of solving that problem in the traditional securities world, especially as that traditional securities world converges and becomes part of the broader digital asset universe, which is our very much our long-term view, Jack, that there yep. will be that, that convergence. So the connective tissue that you're building with Atomic Net is just super important uh, on that roadmap. Great. Um, let me talk now about Today, right? You you hearkened on on this, and uh, I, I should tell everybody that one of the things I really respect about Jack and his team is that, you know, the idea that they had about these different uh, products that are an integral part of the market structure for digital and in the future all all markets, right? Um, that's not something that they just concocted last week. They've been working on this assiduously for years, even when they weren't sexy. Um, when we made the uh, investment initially, we recognized that boring aspect of the space, but we believe that at some point it would become sexy. Uh, now I'm surprised at how fast it, how, how fast it's become sexy, right? I mean, there were, I think, two signal events that, that drove that. One was um, FTX, which, you know, went down like a Chinese spy balloon. Uh, for, for lack of proper institutional guardrails, uh, including custody. And then the second, which Jack talked about, was now the, the, the SEC's proposed rules, which are basically going to mandate the use of qualified crypto custodians in the space. So now you're, you're very, very sexy. Um, can you tell us, Jack, how, how that visibility and, and the, the, the rush, if you will, to adopt this kind of product has affected you guys commercially? 
Yeah, I would say it's um, been a, a, a slow and steady increase. You know, last year was a tough year in crypto land. And I find that that a lot of the managers in the space were, were dealing with the investment side of the portfolio, less so the operational side. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Some something's broke over here when you know Bitcoin's down 70%. A lot of the assets that I own are down 30, 50, 70%. You know, how do I restructure? I'm trying to raise money. You know, we're kind of pulling at the uh, at the at the, the the apron, if you will, saying, hey, why don't you leave Coinbase and come over to us? Uh, or you know, whomever it would be. Um, there was not a lot of growth, organic growth in the um investing space last year. There were lots of conversations, but there were not a, not a lot of new funds being formed last year specifically. We made a lot of headway, but it was more of a market share uh, you know, sort of game where we were fighting a lot of inertia. I'm talking about the custody business. The, the, the fund admin business has a different trajectory, which I can speak to. Post FTX, uh, things have started to change more uh, rapidly because I think there was a realization that maybe having your assets at an exchange that also trades, put, put even before you get to the fraud, uh, they were taking customer assets and making investments or buying condos and you know the, put all that aside, but just, just having all of your assets at the same venue where there's trading being done, et cetera, which is very different than exists in traditional finance, maybe that's not a best practice. And so the volume was turned up you know, in dis really November, December uh, of last year. And the volume has now gone to 11 uh, on, on Wednesday uh, with this new custody rule proposal, which even speaks more to um, the importance of the, the, the building blocks that we have, but also the, um, the conflict-free structure of our business. So our pipeline has never been bigger, not only with the individual funds, uh, but also the, we'll call them the enterprise partnerships. We've had one or two organizations in the last 72 hours ask if they can, what big or trading organizations, can they white label our service? I want to start having that conversation because of this realization that custody is a strategic partner. It's not just a standalone service provider anymore. It's going to be the strategic uh, partner. Um, also, I think the big banks, I was on a, a Bloomberg interview this morning, and I was asked about what the impact would be for the big banks who are not yet in the space. And I happen to think that ultimately in the, in the medium to long term, what this does is give, and again, I keep qualifying this, it's a proposed change to the rule. Now I've got a 4-1 support, uh, Hester Pierce um, uh, was against it, which I think was fairly anticipated. And she's very, very pro crypto. So thinks that it's too stringent what what uh, the proposed guidelines will be. So we'll see what ultimately comes up. But it feels to me like there's going to be some kind of change that we think is going to be a positive for us. I think what that does is give the larger organizations, the you know the BNY Mellon, State Street, Citigroup, Goldman, Morgan, et cetera, a roadmap to say, okay, this is what we would need to do to modify our businesses to support custody of digital assets and crypto. The sell side mirrors the, the buy side. They're going to accelerate those initiatives when the buy side starts asking more and more, saying, hey, you're my current provider at Goldman or State Street or whomever. I'm going to start investing now in crypto because I've gotten more clarity from the SEC as to what I can and can't do. So I've gotten a little bit more guidance. And so what can you do for me? And those organizations are going to want to have an answer as opposed to saying, we're nowhere, we're a couple of years away go talk to standard custody or go talk to Coinbase. And so I think there are sub-custodial opportunities for us. And I think ultimately, or JVs, and ultimately those big banks could be the buyers of companies like ours, as I referenced earlier, because we fit in neatly to um, the, the asset servicing models that exist at banks. They need to get there on their own to say, we want to have a digital solution both for custody and fund administration that we don't have today. And I think beyond just crypto, when you talk to them about this tokenization play, there's much more consensus view at all the large organizations that tokenization will 
become reality X number of years down the road. And this technology is not easy to build. We've had the smartest people in the industry working on it. We're four years in. So it's not something you do overnight. No, but you got Arthur Brito, so. <laughs> got Arthur Brito. Um, that's really interesting, that aspect that you described about how these subcustodial arrangements that are now being discussed uh, with you through this inbound interest from large incumbent custodians, that's effectively a white label solution, right? Where they're basically taking you and, and making you their solution. Uh, that, in my mind, should radically, radically accelerate your go to market. Um, you know, and obviously it assumes that there is a buy side that is demanding that. Right. But assuming that, I mean, it, it it allows you to significantly increase your assets under custody and the number of customers you eventually have um, instead of just doing it organically through your own sales force. That's right. That's right. And those are those are the multiplier effects of those leverage points, you know, that we're yeah. focused on, you know, from a business development standpoint. So it's really a two prong approach of the, you know, hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, you know, combat, if you will, of, of individual managers cross-selling to our fund admin clients, et cetera, but also from biz dev standpoint at the enterprise level. Um, and ultimately maybe licensing out the software where someone could build their own QC. You know, a lot of the banks uh, have, no, I shouldn't say a lot, some of the banks have gone that route. Uh, BMY Mellon did a partnership with a custodial software company um, a number of, I think probably two years ago, and have just rolled out a, a nascent offering there. I believe B of A uh, did a deal with a firm called Copper, which has excellent custodial software. Um, you know, we have a different approach where we're providing the service itself, but but there's nothing stopping us from actually licensing the software out as well. And again, we believe the software that we built um, is really powerful, you know, given the blockchain component of, of what we touched on earlier. Yeah. Terrific. Well, I'm going to ask you a final question so that we can leave time for our members to do their Q&A. Um, indulge me uh, in, in this bit, um, and I'm going to do a little uh, Gadakan or thought experiment with you, Jack. Um, imagine that we're sitting here, but it's not February 2023. It's February 2025. And you are leading PolyScience IPO Roadshow. You're in this massive conference room in uh, New York with portfolio managers that represent some of the biggest potential players in the PolySign IPO book build. You, know, you got the Fidelity guy, the Vanguard guy, the BlackRock guy, et cetera. What would you cite to these guys as the top reasons for them to invest in PolySign? We are institutional grade across the board. And, and that means a couple of really important things. Everything we do is top shelf. The regulator that we go to, the time we've taken to build the technology, the white glove service we have, the complementary fits of the business, the management team that we have, the auditors that we have, the tax preparers, we like everything is top shelf. And that's really important. Uh, we get very good marks from uh, third-party audit firms uh, who are, you know, testing the tech, testing our AML, KYC policies, et cetera. All that is really above board, and that's really important for an investor coming in to know that I'm stepping in to a, an organization that that really minds the details. We're very, very detail-oriented in everything that we do, um, number one. Um, number two, I think the strategic vision of how we've been building the business, uh, the steps we've taken with Stover, for example, uh, our vision around Atomic Net, I think they're all complementary. Uh, I struggle uh, and have to keep reminding myself to focus in this industry that there's so much going on. There's a shiny new object that feels like every day. And we really need to be focused. I tell my team, you know, if you chase too many rabbits, they all get away. And so we need to be focused on what we're doing and not keep pivoting, but also to be flexible because this industry is changing so much. So I think we've got a, a, a focus that makes sense in terms of the products and services and, and client segments uh, that we're building. And I think very importantly, culturally, 
we've got a great organization. And I think culture often gets overlooked and smart people have said, you know, the culture trumps strategy, you know, every day. My view is if you have happy, motivated, aligned, accountable employees, we will have aligned, happy, motivated customers. And if you have happy, aligned customers, we're going to have happy and aligned investors. But it starts it starts within the four walls. And so we spent a lot of time around. We just we just graduated uh, last week from a um, our, our annual offsite for the leadership team. We meet quarterly. We meet every week, but meet in person quarterly and annually. So we reviewed last year's goals and then set out uh, this year's annual goals. We've got five or six company wide goals that we're going to achieve, and one of them is around an employee net promoter score, because I really firmly believe it starts with the employees. And if we can get the employee. We've got touch with great um, net promoter scores today, but we need that 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 takes constant attention, right? We're in we're in the service business. And so if we're have motivated and aligned employees serving our clients and our clients are happy and they tell other clients, then everybody wins. Great. Those insights are are useful for those future investors, but also for, for us here listening to you today and you know running our own respective organizations, Jack. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Karim, I'm turning this over to you for Q&A. Irene's already teed up. Uh, Irene, there's a whole, but so Jack, thank you so much for this uh, insightful um, uh, question, Q&A with Joe. There are so many questions and uh, we'll try and get through them uh, with the Q&A. There are several comments that have been made on the chat as well. We'll see where we can get to that. And there's been several inbound emails already within the uh, last hour with a host of questions. I'm not sure that we'll have time to get through all of them. Uh, you've also noticed that we've put polls up uh, that have been very insightful. Let's start with Brad as the first uh, question out there because he has to jump pretty soon, but Bradley, if you'd start with your question, then Irene, if you'd then go forward into the questions uh, that are on the Q&A um, as a priority, and we'll see as many, uh, we'll go through as many as we can. Right. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Jack, just a pleasure to sit and listen to you talk about PolySign. I mean, very excited. Uh, congratulations for being ready for the SEC and the major move towards quali qualified custodians. Come on in. I mean, that is remarkable right there. I don't know about anybody else. This crypto winter feels like it's going to be crypto spring really soon. Yeah. Uh, Jack, if I could just um, quickly, you know, for a lot of people, and I talk to a lot of people every day, and I try to help them understand poli sign and standard custody. And, you know, I have to ask you, you know, to the layman, like, you know, is it wrong to really see like what poli sign and standard custody are doing as like the next iteration of the DTCC? I just read an, an article, um, a, a good article uh, by Matt Levine, um, who writes for Bloomberg, he used to be a, a regulator uh, that talks specifically about this. There, there is definitely a component to DTCC. I think the, um, in some ways, Atomic Net would be a part of a future DTCC. And I would love to be able to snap my finger. The, the difference between us and DTCC is that DTCC is a common essentially clearinghouse for all different brokers and custodians to come in and they're the one centralized trusted uh, recognized um, you know settlement house in the US we're, we're not you know we're one of, of I don't want to say many we're one of several so you know slightly different on that but there's a component of it and what we want to do on this settlement layer would provide definitely a DTCC like utility to a much bigger outside not just US global, and not just equities, but all asset class. So that is part of the vision, you know, to, to be that. Remarkable. Thank you for that. I hope to get to speak with you further sometimes. Take care, gentlemen. Thank you so much for everybody for having me. Okay, okay I'm going to try and cover as many of these as I can. Um, CBDCs, they're an eminent reality. Um, they're being built on different blockchains. Will you be able to support holding large amounts of value with CBDCs? Certainly the blockchain that we're building would be able to, I think governments are going to need to determine how they want to uh, support CBDCs. And so you've got a number of different initiatives. Um, we are not a blockchain um, as opposed to, you know, Ethereum or others that would say, come and store all your assets on our blockchain. 
we, and, and specifically Atomic Net, we are an interoperable chain between different chains. It, it gets fairly technical. Um, it would require a longer amount of time, but we could be a very core part of a CBDC offering. And we are talking specifically to, um, you know, one central bank who is interested in potentially working with us to issue a CBDC specifically around the payments um, business, and they would be leveraging the blockchain that underpins Atomic Net. So that's a, that's an area where we want to spend some time. I'm going to say it that way. Okay, great. Um, the other question that's come in a couple of times is Atomic Net is driven by smart contracts, correct? Also a technical uh, question. It's, there's a smart contract-like component to it. I would say it that way, where essentially what it does is take, um, you can think of it as taking a snapshot or, or a memorialization. If you go back to the example that Joe and I had where, you know, Joe's got shares in PolySign, he can evidence that they are in his name, that the company has waived the ROFR, that there's no encumbrance on it. I've got a million dollars at Wells Fargo held in an escrow account that we can memorialize and evidence that it's in my name, free and clear, ready to go. We take snapshots of those two things and, and pair them off in a smart contract like way to say, if these two conditions are met, then this happens and a swap happens. If these two conditions are not met, this, the swap does not happen. And, and so there's a, there's a smart contract like element to that, where it is more mathematically driven formulaic of events coming together and creating an outcome that doesn't require a human intuition or a subjective decision being made. Okay, I'm said. Um, will assets be insured on PolySign's platform? Assets are insured on Standard Custody's platform, which is the custody business, which I think is probably what the question was meant to, to ask. But yes, we've got um, insurance through uh, Lloyds of London. Okay, great. Um, if every crypto was to deplete, um, what would be PolySign's core business? So the fund administration business would continue uh, because a lot of the investors, first of all, that's not all all crypto uh, or digital. We've got some standalone. I had breakfast yesterday with a $400 million private equity fund that invests in technology, software, et cetera. Uh, nothing to do with crypto. Um, so that business would uh, continue. There's also a lot of private investments made in Web3 companies a lot of our clients have, et cetera, that are outside of crypto per se. Uh, so we would probably grow the non-crypto part of that business. Um, the standard custody business would focus on the future of the non-crypto part of the digital asset industry. So what I talked about before, tokenization. Now, I think the business would realistically take a step back before two steps forward, it would depend upon how quickly that business can advance. But the one thing, even if all of our customers left, what I still have at that point is a New York Trust Bank license. I've got a bunch of money transmitter licenses. I've got an MSB license from FinCEN, et cetera. And those are very valuable. And, and what it allows us to do is custody securities and non-securities. Um, and so we would we would pivot that business a little bit with a focus on the, the non-crypto digital part. And Atomic Net very much still alive and well. That's the that's the moonshot idea. Again, a play towards a belief in future tokenization or digitization. If, if none of that was going to happen and we were going to go backwards, not forward as a capital markets, which I think is highly unlikely, putting crypto to the side, if no tokenization or digitization was ever going to happen, um, we would grow the fund admin business and I would probably call Joe and look for a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, who are possible disruptors to PolySign? And we've had a couple of questions, um, people asking, who are your three competitors? Well, we have competitors in each um, in each of the businesses, um, less so in Atomic Net, but certainly there are other fund administrators. There's two or three uh, fund administrators that, um, particularly digital asset investors, uh, would consider. Uh, we're the premier provider of that service, uh, but you can go to some lower cost providers. NEV Consulting uh, is one of them. Uh, another um, company called Formidium. Uh, on the custody front, uh, there are a number, right? You can go to Coinbase today. You can go to uh, Gemini. Um, you know, there's others out there. Fidelity, if all you want to do is buy and hold Bitcoin, you can go there. Um, so not all custodians are equal. And I think there's going to be a lot of shaking out in terms of 
um, how the custody rule requires a segregation of duties. And so, but but there are other you know competitors today. You know, in terms of the disruptors, you know, everyone's got their own business model. Um, and I um, certainly don't have visibility to everybody. I mean, I, I think that ultimately some would say, well, what happens when the big banks come in? You know, if you're a traditional hedge fund or or you know mutual fund or investment advisor, or, you know, would you rather use a you know a startup custodian or or BNY Mellon or Citigroup? You know, if you're already using them, um, so there's a lot of logic why you would continue using your current provider, not establishing a new relationship if they can provide that same service. And so I think there's that intermediate M and A step that would happen before. I don't. I don't worry about you know city getting into this space anytime soon. I'm more focused in, on whether city can be a customer of ours. Gotcha. What percent of revenue is U.S. versus international? And then quickly following on from that, what international markets are most promising? Ninety-five percent of our revenue is in the U.S. today. Um, we are watching. I'd say Europe. Um, you know, there's more business to be done and we just haven't done a good job of capitalizing all of our boots on the ground or here in the US. And I'm particularly watching uh, the Middle East, UAE. Uh, we do have one client there, maybe two, we're about to onboard somebody in Hong Kong, but uh, the UAE is being very forward footed on the space in general, particularly the tokenization play. And uh, you're seeing more and more pronouncements. A friend of mine just took over head of a, a new regulatory uh, agency in the UAE. And I think you're going to see a lot more sandbox type support and development happening there. Uh, and obviously a lot of, a lot of money there. Um, Dean is saying, hi, Jack, and thanks so much for sharing your insights and your time. Will we as accredited investors in PolySign be able to have PolySign custody selected cryptocurrency holdings as a source of passive income for us in the future? I'm not sure I totally understand the question. If you're an accredited investor, you can become a client of ours if, that, if that's the question. Uh, we don't do retail, but our our um, threshold there is whether you're an accredited investor or not. Is PolySign's focus on TradFi adoption of virtual assets instead of DeFi? I would say both. I'm long-term greedy. So we are certainly spending a lot of time talking to traditional finance organizations who want to get into the space and want to be a bridge to help get them there. Uh, we do have DeFi clients as well, and I think there are a lot of DeFi um applications and um, offerings that probably have some long-term, not probably, that will have some long-term viability. I think this custody rule is going to be an important part of, of how that works. Um, so kind of watch this space, but we do have DeFi clients, and I think that's going to be ultimately a growth area. Um, Blair is asking, how does PolySign interoperate with Ripple and the XRPL? We currently um, have a very good, I think, relationship with Ripple, but they're currently not a customer of ours. We have been talking to them about uh, supporting XRPL tokens, and that's a, you know, an ongoing conversation. Can we describe the fund administration technology as a one-stop shop? That is, if one can launch an XYZ Capital with PolySign as the fund administration partner, partner, and it's ready to go. Yes. We do that every day. So you can launch a fund with us. We can be your custodian at Standard Custody and provide your fund administration at MG Stover. That was part of the um, thesis in acquiring that business. And we've been cross marketing going to market together with both of those offerings where, where appropriate. Okay. Um, and we've had this question actually quite a few times. Will PolySign custody NFTs? If so, will staking NFTs be available? You guys ask really, really good questions. Um, yes, we will custody NFTs. Um, staking of NFTs, staking is another, you know, <laughs> that was last week's news or two weeks news, uh, two weeks ago, um, you know, by the SEC looking at staking, they find Kraken, uh, Brian Armstrong from Coinbase is kind of going hard at them. The, the issue there is whether or not the, uh, staking yield or reward is deemed to be a security. And if it is a security, then what kind of regulatory framework would exist in order, in order for that to um, be supported? So we've got some questions as an industry to be answered. 
um, around staking. But in the meantime, um, I think staking has a role to play, very much so. We've got some great partners at Figment and Block Team that we work with around staking, and we'll continue to do so so long as um, you know that's within the, the purview of what we can do as a custodian. I think coming back to it, having a qualified custodian is such a linchpin for all these different types of of ancillary um, or, or complementary services like staking. And so um, I, I believe in the future of NFTs and I believe in the future of staking. What what form that takes is still a little bit of uh, uh, TBD. Um, I We have, there's a ton more questions, but I'm conscious of time and um, it is half past. Do you have time for one more? Or I could just say yes to everything, but that probably gets me in trouble, right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I do have time for one more. Okay, great. Gregory is asking, Jack, what percentage of gross revenues do you anticipate from each of your three business products? Um, I know what we've modeled um, and what we, I, I think custody, I'm hesitating just because the world feels like it's changed so radically in the last month or two. It's hard to say. I think ultimately custody will be bigger than the fund administration business and atomic net is kind of anyone's guess. I don't mean to be cheeky uh, on that. We've got um, you know revenue coming in the second half of this year for atomic net. Uh, if you listen to Arthur, this is a change the world kind of you know opportunity in technology. And it's as I refer to it as a moonshot idea. Um, the opportunity set is just so vast and so great, it's kind of hard to put numbers around it. So I'm not giving you a good answer, and I, I apologize. Particularly, it's my last one, and I strive to give specific answers to questions. It's it's a tough one. This industry is just too dynamic to really pinpoint that. Okay, I can tell you the, the fund administration business is a lower. Um, it, it's a low. It's a less volatile business, right? It's less alpha. There's a lot more beta to that business, which is part of the beauty of it. It's a steady eddy business where things like custody, where we charge on basis points of assets uh, and you know the adoption curve just swings much more, even though it's not transaction like an exchange, there is much more, um, uh, a much more linear relationship to you know, investment and the price of the underlying asset. And so I think that business has greater upside or downside to it, you know, depending upon what your view of the, of the markets are. Thank you. And before you go, Jack, just an administrative thing. I, I know of at least two. I'm sure there are more clients of ours who are uh, very specifically interested in forming small crypto funds and managing them and would like to custody people as they set those up. How do I direct that interest? Um, let's, I mean, the easy, easy thing is just to, to send it to me. I'm Jack at polysign.io uh, and I'll get you to the right, you know, salesperson to, to talk to you about that. And even just to pick our brain, you know, we're, we're okay. a lot of time. So why don't we do this? Every, anybody in the audience, yeah, that's interested, um, come to me um, and shoot me an email and then I'm going to collate all the names and send them over to Jack and then he can follow up or have his people follow up. And uh, Joe's email is joe at linkedin.com. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We, so, Jack, thank you so much. Before we go, a couple of different things. Uh, I did say we have a lot of questions still pending. And you might have seen a lot of uh, the polls that go up. That was interesting. The responses on the polls were quite interesting. What I'd like to suggest the next steps are is that uh, we will send you all the questions, um, create uh, the polls for you to review. And if you could have uh, yourself or your team respond to those questions. We will then collate all of those and send it to all of our attendees, if that's okay. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds like we should uh, have another session one of these days. All right. So that was my next question to the audience. Thank you so much for being here. When do we want Jack back? That's the thing. If I get more than one response, we'll have Jack back. <laughs> so all of you that are still here, please say yes to having Jack back because uh, we do have a lot to cover. The other question I have for you uh, from the audience is, uh, should we continue investing in PolySign? Is this a company that we see a lot of future in and potential for growth is? If you want us to invest and continue to invest and bring the opportunity back to you, uh, say yes, please. And then we'll know the difference in the answer to that question. Uh, so thank you so much. 
I love it. Uh, you know, usually great. when I have a rough day, I call my mom and just say, mom, I need a little love. And she tells me how great she thinks I am. And this is like, it's better than that. You know, I'm getting, <laughs> getting yes, pleases from people I don't even know. Yeah, you got 200 people saying yes, please right now, Jack. So that's oh, really good. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you all for letting us um, uh, host this, host you, Jack and Joe. Uh, thank you, Jack, for letting us invest in you. We will continue to do that more and bring uh, the opportunity to our uh, other investors. Uh, before you all go, we do have another link to learn coming up in two weeks' time. The, it will be in your chat. Please register for that. It is an opportunity for you to spread the word with your friends. This is all about equity. If you know friends um, and executives in companies who are looking for liquidity for some of the shares or options that they do have, and they may want some liquidity out of them, uh, come to the next session because there's a lot of things that we need to learn uh, that we can share with you uh, on the next link to learn. It will be in the chat. Sign up for that. Uh, show up, uh, share it with your friends, and um, we'll have Jack back. So we'll coordinate the questions with you, um, have you uh, the opportunity to respond to them. We'll share them with all the audience that registered, uh, close to 300 people for today registered for this event, uh, and they will receive uh, the responses back. Uh, to those questions and the poll insights, Jack, I think would be very interesting for your company to view, to understand. A lot of people want to invest. Uh, there's some clarity that they do need about uh, your market position and uh, your strengths and how you present yourself against potential competitors. Uh, if we get some sort of response to that, we'll get more folks uh, to engage with us. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.